Hey guys, it's Bee Buster here. So I want to try something and if it works well, we'll do more of it. If you guys have a story that you'd like to feature in a video, please leave a comment below with your story in it, and the most liked comment with a story in it, I'll include in a video. Also, if you could like the video and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any uploads, that would be awesome. I hope you enjoy the video guys, and without further ado, let's bust a nut. I'm a big outdoorsman from Pittsburgh, PA, so of course, when I decided to go to college, I had to keep in mind that having some decent woods nearby was pretty much a must. Upon checking a, a couple of places out, I decided on going to Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, or just the borough. But the biggest plus about going to that university is that my uncle Fred lived up there and was a well-known name in the community. He owns to this day a, a framing shop right in the middle of the small town area. This was a, a huge plus since knowing people like that always equals more land to put spots in. And that was all I really needed to pick the college that I'd be going to. Edinburgh was really cool because there are a lot of old buildings and strange flat landscapes as compared to the hilly land around Pittsburgh. So it was cool to have to figure out how to scout the game that I'd be going after once the season started. But my main hunting area was directly behind my uncle's house too. He has a beautiful log cabin that sits back off the road with woods on all sides of it. It was a, a true thing of beauty, let me tell you. When he had the house built, he actually had the gigantic chimney made of flat stones that were found in the woods behind the house. More on that later too. So, as I was scouting the area for the first time, I came upon a, a few different circles of boulders in the middle of the woods. But they were definitely very old, and the boulders were quite big too. They were much too big to just be moved there for some reason, like a, a group of guys camping out or something. They must have taken at least 10 men to move them, and only if they had some kind of pulley system or something of the sort. There were also smaller rocks too, and when I say smaller, I'm talking like somewhere around 300 pounds or more. They made inner circles inside of the larger boulders. It was pretty crazy, and I found a total of seven of these stands throughout the property. Some of the rocks were now part of the chimney. They simply had to be with the amount of rocks that he used on it. Oh, and uh, also, these rock circles also made a, a much larger circle around the woods. After a few days of scouting with my buddy Brandon, we were sure that we had our spots picked out for the first day of archery. We couldn't wait to get out there, and it was a perfect day too. It was great, and the thing about Edinburgh, PA, is that it gets more snow per year than most of Alaska due to the lake effect snow coming across Lake Erie. But what happens is, before the lake freezes completely over, the water which is warmer than the air pushes the clouds way high up in the atmosphere. Too high for them to actually snow due to how low the temperature all the way up there gets. The clouds then come back inland and fall back toward Earth. It takes about 20 miles to do this. Edinburgh is about 20 miles from that lake too. You see what I'm saying? Anyway... On the first day of archery, which is in the first week of October in Pennsylvania, there was a thin layer of snow, and this is perfect for archery because you can see the deer in the woods much more easily, and you can also see if animals left any tracks. If they did, they were fresh since the snow didn't happen too long before that. In our trees for about um, two hours, I'd say, neither of us had seen anything yet. I had just got off the radio with Brandon, who was on the other side of the property, and when I saw some movement over to my right in the pine thicket. I then see a branch move a little bit and I see four deer legs under. I readied my bow and my stand so as to make a good clean shot at the deer. I ran 15 feet up a tree. I did this very carefully. About a minute later, I was looking for any movement again and I lost the four legs inside of the thicket. This was expected though due to the fact that where that deer would have been is a common feeding area for them. So I just sat there and waited. Maybe another minute later, I, I caught movement again. It looked as if the deer would break through the thicket into more open woods at the moment that I've been waiting for. As I brought my bow up into a full-drawn stance, I was stunned by what I was seeing. Where the deer should have been, there was now a man there. 
and a strange-looking man at that. This absolutely should not have been. I mean, if there was a man anywhere near where the deer had been, the deer would have been long gone by now, spooked back into the thicket, and I would have seen it. I put my bow back down onto the hook that I had screwed into the tree and lifted my binoculars to my eyes. But only around 35 yards away, I could now see great detail of physical appearance. He was rather rotund, with a, a belly leading the way, and a white long sleeve shirt on with ruffles down the middle of it. Just like the pirate shirt in that one episode of Seinfeld, if any of you so indulged. It was tucked into thick canvas brown pants, with pants being tucked into white socks directly below his knees. Further down, where his shoes should have been, was absolutely nothing. He didn't have any feet whatsoever. No cars, no shins, no shoes. With my eyes wide open, I, I mouthed to myself, what the hell? Instead of walking, he kind of seemed to float through the woods, going from left to right. And this is when I started noticing other extremely strange things about him. I looked through the binoculars at his head and it was cocked back with his chin resting down on his lower neck. His very large red bulbous nose was up in the air a bit in a sort of snobby overall look. The hair, though, the hair, it was covered by a wig that judges in England would wear kind of thing. A white wig with three curls on the side of it where his ear would have been. I noticed that he didn't just seem to float through the woods, too. He actually was floating through the woods. His arms stayed stuck at his sides, unmoving as he traveled. He also never looked down, and the way his head was cocked, he could have only been looking upward. This... It's not how any person or animal walks in the woods, just constantly looking down and around for obstacles that you may trip over. All of this happened within a time frame of about uh, maybe 20 seconds or so. He had come out of the thicket behind a medium-sized oak tree, and then when he hit the next oak, he just never came out from behind it. I watched in just absolute astonishment for another five minutes, waiting for him to break his cover so that I could see him again, but this just never happened. I told Brandon what had just happened and was immediately made fun of. I expected that that was what would be coming through the radio after I got done talking. He was saying how I, I should have taken a picture of the only dear human minotaur remaining in the world. I told him that he wouldn't be laughing though when the deerator came over to his tree and just smacked his butt right out of it. Even though it was in the middle of a hunt, I, I had to get down to see what the hell had just happened. I knew where he would have walked, not only would I have seen footprints in the snow, but it would have also been very easy to see even better tracks due to the fact that the area where we were was just full of muddy ground. I mean, a freaking hummingbird would have left tracks in this muddy mess. But, as you probably guessed, when I got over to that spot where he'd been, I didn't see one track from him, or a deer, or anything else that lives on the planet Earth. I was just utterly confused and quite amazed to be honest and what happened later that night well that was just as creepy so after i'd got done checking out the muddy snowy ground where the man should have left some kind of sign or footprints i went back to my tree stand and climbed back up to the height that i'd been hunting from earlier i radioed brandon and told him that i was back up in the tree and secure we always did this as a, a kind of precaution in case something happened while we were climbing the tree or securing the platforms of the portable tree stand. But my old man's buddy Bunky actually saved his left eye from being completely blind and useless this way. He was practicing shooting from a, a raised platform when he slipped and fell off, driving a stick right into his eyeball as he hit the ground. This has nothing to do with the story, mind you, but all you hunters out there should adopt this practice. You know the old saying, the more you know and all that. But anyway, I digress. So we hunted the rest of the day, but not without periodic raging from Brandon making fun of me about the deer at all throughout the rest of the hunt. I knew at that point that I'd be hearing about it for at least a week or so, maybe longer. But that is, of course, if the rest of the night would have been a normal one. Which it turns out, it wasn't. As twilight approached, I radioed Brandon and told him that I was going to start getting out of the tree. Brandon was actually in a built stand that we'd found while scouting in the months prior. 
So I had him meet me at my spot, due to the fact that it was going to take me much longer to get to my stand and off the tree. And just as I thought, Brandon was walking up to my spot right as I was getting to the bottom of the tree. Once I got all the way to the bottom, I unhooked the straps that were around my feet, jumped down to the ground and started feverishly explaining to him again everything that happened. I took him over to the muddy area to show him that there were absolutely no tracks in the snow or, or the mud at least. I definitely could sense though that he didn't completely believe everything I was telling him. I was able to sense this so easily because he looked right at me with his mouth agape and his eyebrows pushing up towards the middle of his forehead and said, are you messing with me brother? He also was able to tell that I wasn't messing with him though when I looked at him with what I'm sure are some of the craziest eyes that he's ever seen and said hell no. When he realized that I was 100% serious, he started taking inventory of all the things that I had previously told him and we went back and forth trying to make any kind of sense of what I had seen at all. While we were talking to each other back and forth, we had failed to notice that nighttime was already pretty much upon us. It was that uh, Stephen King kind of full dark, no stars kind of night too. Due to the fact that we were looking for signs left behind from the ghost guy, we were in a patch of woods that we weren't familiar with as well. We may have been pretty close to where my stand was, but once night falls in the woods, it's a whole different ball game. Still, the patch of woods we were in was uh, enclosed by a triangle of roads. All we had to do was walk in a straight line and we'd come out somewhere on one of the roads and then just walk that road back to my uncle's house. And so, we just started walking. Walking in a straight line in the woods is uh, almost impossible to do without a compass, which I didn't have. So, we were both figurative and literally in the dark when it came to where we were. And, a couple of minutes into the walk, we heard a loud scream as if someone was being murdered. Now, I know what pretty much every animal in the woods around here sounds like, both normally or in a panic mode making death cries. I see videos often on YouTube of people recording a sound in their backyard that they think is a person who needs help, only to be a, a rabbit screaming from being attacked by some sort of predator like a coyote or some sort of fox. But this, this was definitely not that at all. After waiting a couple of minutes to see if the screaming would continue, we started walking again in the direction that we thought that we should be going. We didn't talk much after this about what we had heard and what we had seen, probably because of the anxiety that we were both feeling. But we couldn't ignore it for too long though because we heard another long blood-curdling scream not long after. It was closer this time too and sounded different. At first we thought it sounded like a, a woman being attacked but this new scream sounded threatening. And ironically, we felt like we were the ones being stalked and hunted at this point. But still, we pushed forward. After walking about another hundred yards, we came across something really strange. Directly in our path were these weird clear gelatinous masses on top of the leaf litter. Now, I'm 32, which isn't an age that necessarily screams wisdom from experience, but I've been in the woods since as far back as I can even remember. My old man taught me everything there is to know about the wilderness around us, so take it from me that these clear globs, they just shouldn't have been there and I've never seen anything like them. The only thing that I could think of that could even slightly look like it was a, a tree sap and this was absolutely not sap. I know that for sure. I poked one of the masses with a stick, fearing what they were made of. Their consistency was like that of a, a thick gelatin. Like if you made jello with only one cup of water instead of two. After looking at it for a while and it getting darker, we decided that we needed to get out of there and so we started walking again. And we started to come across a, a good amount of this stuff too. It wasn't all over the woods, but instead it was kind of directly in front of us as we walked. Almost like someone or something knew which route we would try to take and marked it with these globs. And then there was another scream. And this time it was even closer. And with a little something added to it. This time, not too far away from us, 
we actually heard leaves rustling and a couple of twigs snap. Something was definitely there. It could have been a deer, but this was very unlikely. Whatever it was, wasn't spooked at all by us too. Not from us or the threatening screen. It's easy to tell when you've spooked an animal and they just start bolting. On top of that, most of the leaves were still very moist, therefore not making as much noise as they normally would. This obviously sent our anxiety levels through the roof. At that point, the only thing that was on our mind was just getting the hell out of there. We were no longer curious about the floating men, the screams, or alien jelly or whatever the hell it was. We just wanted out, which... It should have been very soon, mind you. I mean, the distance we walked should have come across a road by now, but it hadn't just quite yet. Stranger still, we couldn't even see any house or streetlights at all. Still, we, we kept walking, thinking that we'd find our way out very, very soon, and this was not to be, at least not yet. Our flashlights were now beginning to die too, so we were definitely in a hurry at this point. Which, by the way, is not what you should do if you're ever even maybe lost in the woods in the dark. Uh, cool heads will always prevail in that situation. Anyway, as we were walking, we started to see a couple of pine trees. This was really strange because we had thoroughly scouted this land and the only pine trees were over near my stand where we started. After seeing a couple more, we started to get a, a foreboding feeling. Almost like a sick, anxious panic feeling. We stopped for a minute to check our surroundings and found that at the exact spot that we'd stopped was the same spot that we had started. But we were standing right next to the pine tree with a dead pine next to it that had a branch broken off and dangling still from the severed limb. But how could this be? We had been sure that we were walking in a, a somewhat straight shot out, but... That must have been an impossibility since we definitely made a circle back. We had no idea whatsoever how this happened, especially since we were in the exact spot that we had started at. Not five miles to the left, not five miles to the right, the exact same spot. Also very strange is that we saw my tree stand that was still hanging on the tree and it was very close to us, but when we started to walk out to it, it was nowhere to be found. We walked over to it and immediately found the trail that we had taken to get out of the woods initially. It led directly back to my uncle's yard and the trail actually went right past the live pine tree that we had just been standing under. Now, there is just no way that we had missed this at the beginning. And to add more to the strangeness too, as we walked only about 20 yards down the trail, we could plainly see my uncle's light that he had above his garage to illuminate his driveway. Well... Needless to say, uh, our minds were just totally blown, but at least now we were able to get the heck out of here. On the last hundred yards on the trail, we found more clear gelatinous globs directly down the middle of the pass too. This was definitely crazy because they absolutely were not there when we walked in. We had both been on that trail when we entered the woods and we would have seen them for sure. We heard no more screams after the time we heard the rustling of the leaves too and the twigs break, but... We had a strong feeling of just being watched when we were still in the woods, and an even stronger version of that same feeling as we stopped into my uncle's backyard. And this is definitely at the top of my list for the scariest experiences in the woods that I have ever had. I still have no explanation for not even a part of it. Not the floating ghost guy, not the screams or the globes, not the getting lost in the woods, and not even the circles or the boulders. Honestly, I would love to hear from anyone who had anything like this happen to them. There has to be some kind of answer, but at this point, all I have is my story about what happened that night, and thankfully, one other person who went through it with me. I mean, at least he's been able to validate what had happened to people that really don't believe this actually happened to us. And whether you guys believe it or not is uh, totally up to you, but I promise that this all happened exactly how I wrote it. I know it sounds pretty crazy and kind of out there, but this actually happened. And that's a scary thing to think about next time you guys find yourselves in the woods. 
Something incredible had happened back there, and I'm thankful that we were able to get out of the woods without having anything happen to us. What it did do, though, was made my wanting to understand the paranormal even stronger. But one day, I'm going to go back there by myself and camp for a night or two in hopes that something might happen again and that I have the balls to seek whatever it was out and get some answers that I desperately need. This takes place in a fairly large city roughly eight or so years ago. I'm female and at the time I was in my mid-twenties. So there used to be a gay bar that did these goth nights every Saturday night and I would head out there fairly often with my friends. This night there was a group of about five of us that went together, plus we always ran into more people that we knew once we got there too. At some point I left my friends on the dance floor and went up to the bar to get another drink. It was pretty crowded, so the only place I could squeeze into was next to some guy on a bar stool at the very end of the counter. I ordered my drink, and he looked over and said hello, and he had a pretty interesting accent, so I asked him where it was from. He replied that he was originally from Ethiopia, and we made small talk as I was waiting for my drink, and I commented that I had a neighbor as a child that was from Ethiopia as well. The exact details of the conversation are a, a bit hazy. It was years ago after all, and to be fair, I wasn't paying super close attention at the time. And so, I'm not sure how the conversation went in this direction, but I do remember his words snapping my brain's focus back onto him. He said, I killed people there. <laughs> well, uh, I awkwardly chuckled thinking that maybe this was some sort of weird drunk guy thinking that he would just say weird creepy things to a goth girl at the bar to make small talk or something. I mean, maybe it was just a really bad attempt at flirting. My drink arrived and I remember stirring it and trying to ease my way out of the conversation, but I was still waiting for my change. You used to kill people? He shook his head and replied casually, no, I still do. Well, my change could not arrive fast enough at this point. I tried another awkward laugh and made some snarky comment about how I was fat and if he tried to kill me, I'd fight back and sit on him or something. I don't know, I mean, I had no idea what to say in this situation if I'm being honest. Again, casually, without any emotion in his face, he replied, there's no trying, if I decide to kill someone, I kill them. My change finally arrived and I took my drink, which I had not let leave my hand or line of sight for any instant, excused myself and headed back over to my friends on the dance floor. I watched as he turned on his stool so that he could keep an eye on me and he just sat there, sipping on his drink, never looking away too. But finally, at some point, I saw him put down his empty glass and move out from the front door. I sighed in relief and continued on to enjoy my night. Several hours later, the goth night was ending and the next theme, DJ, was taking over. My friends and I were saying our goodbyes and I started to walk to the front door and I turned around to see the friend that had given me a ride was stuck in conversation with another acquaintance, so I just waited near the door, just inside the building. And that was when he grabbed me. But the guy from the bar dragged me farther into a dark corner out of line of the exit. I was in shock and couldn't make a sound at first as he pinned me to the wall, face pressed against it, and he twisted one of my arms behind my back. It seemed like an eternity that he held me there, pushing himself up firmly behind me, almost like he was trying to hide me in even more shadows. But mind you, there were no lights near us and no reason for anyone to walk by this corner too. Even if I yelled, I wasn't sure if anyone was going to hear me since the DJ had started up again. Somehow I, I managed to shove myself against him once my fight instincts kicked in that was and in his shock his grip loosened just a bit and the angle he held me at relaxed and I managed to shove my fist against his balls. I have no idea to this day how I actually bent myself around in just the right way but he doubled over and I took my cue and ran. I grabbed my friend out of a conversation and just breathlessly gave a cliff notes version of what happened as I dragged it to the back emergency exit. Before I could escape, I was stopped by security, and he told me that I couldn't go that way and had to leave through the front door of the bar. I tried to explain to him that there was this guy up there that had tried to attack me, but he wouldn't listen or just tuned it out or thought that I was some drunk girl or something. Thankfully, my friend and I managed to get the attention of a few other people that we knew, and we headed out the front as a group. 
I didn't see the guy anywhere, but I was terrified of getting through the dark parking lot to the car. I just knew that he could be out there hiding somewhere. My friend and I, we ran as fast as we could and dove into the car and she pulled out of the parking space before I could even get my seatbelt on. And the creeper dude, he was nowhere to be seen. I checked the news the next day to see if there had been any other attacks or, God forbid, murders in the area, but there was nothing. I don't really remember much of his features or what he was wearing or how he sounded, but I'll never forget the emotionless and blank matter-of-fact way that he just stated that he would kill people, and the way his dark eyes just stared at me like, like I was prey. When it was seven or eight, my family went to the beach and we rented a room there. We had the kind of rooms where you kind of rent out both and they connect through a door and whatnot. And there's the doors to leave the room and the doors to the other room and in the room connected to ours, there was this army family, a, a military dad and some kids and a wife. My older sister was supposed to be watching me as we were down at the jacuzzi during the evening and whatnot. As we were playing and hanging out and just having a pretty good time... I didn't get out much, was naive, and all around just a little kid. We were both white skin, blue eyes, and blonde hair too. This mum literally sits in the jacuzzi with us. She starts talking to us and is just making herself real comfortable. I was very naive as a kid too, and eventually we started talking books, and she was talking about her kids, who we never saw, mind you, and we're just having a good conversation. Really in depth, I felt like. My sister decides that she wants to go back to the room, but I don't, and I wanted to stay and talk with the mum, so my sister goes back to the room, and now it's just me, seven-year-old, and some 40-year-old woman. It should have set off some creepy alarms, but for some reason it, uh, it just didn't. And then, she starts talking about going and walking on the beach. It's like 10pm, and she wants to go walk on the beach and get some shells, and I thought it was a great idea. I'd get to walk on the beach at night. I felt so free and like a big kid. I didn't need my sister or anything, so I run back to the room to tell my grandparents that I'm walking to the beach with Sue, or whatever her name was, and I remember my grandmother reading her book barely listening to what I said, and she just kind of shook me off. It's probably important to know, too, that I didn't live with my parents. So I start walking down the creepy motel corridor... Really, it was a, a dark dim stairwell at a cheap motel on the beach, and I'm going through the stairwell like something out of a movie, and uh, the mum's way at the bottom telling me to hurry up and this and that, and while walking through the stairs, army dad comes running, hauling ass to where I'm at, and he told me, your mum is calling you, it's really important that we gotta go. And he basically grabbed me by my waist, softly, not aggressively, and led me back to our room. He knocked on the door and explained what had happened, and I never thought much of it until about a, a year ago when it came back to me. I mean, this woman, she was leading me away to a beach alone at night, and this army guy got a terrible feeling in his gut. And so he intervened. And when he said that my mum was looking for me too, as I didn't live with my mum, it kind of set off some alarm bells in my head. And that's when I realised that something was definitely up. So I, I didn't resist going back to my family. As a kid, I, I knew since he was saying my mum wanted me that it was important. I just knew that something was up because I don't live with my mum. I'm now 20 years old and I truly believe that that mum was trying to lure me away to do God knows what. And this army dude had a bad feeling and probably saved my life that day. Thinking back on it, I, I get such a bad feeling all throughout my body. I know now that the chances of me making it back from the beach trip, they were slim to none. So, before I get to the story, I have to share some important information for this tale. But for any history fanatics out there, I live in a really old fishing town in East England notorious for being haunted. And nearly every alley has a story and a popular place for ghost hunters. Also, this was about three years ago and I was working in a big retail store in the UK. 
I was a night shelf stacker, basically. Deliveries would usually come in at about 8pm and I'd work until usually 2am just putting it away, logging on the system and blah blah blah. Anyway, uh, some nicer deliveries would just turn up later and I would have to work later. It was good money and I had no priorities whatsoever. But the night this happened, the delivery turned up at about 10pm. This was a ball ache for a lot of us since we knew that we would be leaving later than usual, but the general consensus was again, good money, so whatever. And so we didn't end up finishing up until about 3.30 or 4am I think it was sometime around there anyway so i usually biked home so it was no trouble and i finished up with the other guys and i had a cigarette as the various people left in cars and their own bikes which was usually the case anyway i then proceeded to hop onto my bike and start the journey home i got maybe 20 feet before i realized that my tire was bloody flat and great i thought what should have been a 10 minute bike ride would now turn into 30 minutes walking in pitch black streets. The street lights turn off at midnight here except from the main roads. So off I went walking with my bike and the first 20 minutes of the journey went pretty fine. Then I, I just started to feel strange. It was rare that I would feel so superstitious but something just sat wrong all of a sudden. I was walking on a main road, lights on too, that went past the town's college. It was two empty medium-sized car parks outside and a large bike shed that always had a light on inside for some reason. My home was literally around the corner from the college, so I tried to shrug off the feeling as I was almost home anyway, but there was definitely some more checks over the shoulder if you can catch my drift. I strolled past, bike in hand, when I heard something weird whistling it was slow and it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand too i came to a realization after my friend showed me the reddit comment called the whistler that it was the exact whistle in the video that he uploaded so this just makes it even weirder for me now anyway i i immediately spun my head towards the source and it was the bike shed and what i saw was a, a girl she must have been teenagerish too. Her head was poking up from a wall next to the bike shed about a uh, hundred feet from me. Her hair was dark because she was silhouetted by the light of the bike shelter and her eyes were dark too. As soon as I saw her, she darted down as if hiding. Bear in mind, I had seen no one else this night. Not many people wander around at 4am in the winter in a small town, I guess. I felt creeped out though immediately and started to walk a lot faster with my bike towards home. As I kept peering back and walking, I saw her pop her head up once more and dart back. As I got out of view of the college, I turned into my pitch black road. There was a single lit street lamp that could be seen behind me on the main street, and then I saw something even weirder. It looked like a, an older man, maybe in his 50s or 60s, standing slightly to the side of the street lamp as if he was trying to stay out of sight. He was standing with something in between both of his hands, like a, a piece of string or wire or something, and as he was turning it in his palms while smiling at me, he didn't move at all and just stood there. I couldn't take the weirdness anymore, and I just broke off into a sprint with my bike, and I ran down my alley that led into my back gate. My heart was racing as I bolted the gate behind me too and I just sat for a moment and listened for any sound of being followed. For a good two minutes it was silent and the air was weirdly still for a winter night and then, then I heard that whistling again. It sounded like it was at the bottom of my alleyway too and I lived about halfway up the road so it was quite a ways away. I just slowly walked to my back door with as little noise as possible, just in case whoever it was was listening out for which house I'd gone into, and I just tried to be extra cautious, I guess. I have no idea what these two people were doing out at this time, and my brain was racked of all sorts of possibilities when I think of it. Was she hiding from that man? I mean, she looked about early teens, maybe, or did they know each other? I don't know, but... I just can't help feeling that I was caught in the middle of something out there. Something that was not good. A 
a 24-year-old female that moved from Orlando to Florida. It's 18 miles just outside of Valdosta, Georgia. Pretty much middle of nowhere, mind you, to my family farm. I've never had any issues in Orlando, but I got divorced and had to move in with my mum. It was my two small boys and I too. Anyways, we moved into one of the old farmhouses on my family's farm and it needed a lot of work. It was eight bedrooms and a mother-in-law suite. When we moved in, we only had two rooms cleaned up and worked on the rest of the house over the course of nine months. The man across the street, Jay, was very helpful too. From day one, he would come almost every day as he was feeding up his animals and help with anything that I needed. Over the course of nine months, I never had any issues and thought that he was just a friendly middle-aged man. I never felt that he had any ill intentions and the farmhouse was in a, a U-shape. The room that I had chose had windows in the courtyard area and this was the middle of the house and Jay had fenced in that area when I first moved in so I could let the boys play. The farmhouse was in the middle of the farm and set off the road so I never had any worries of being watched and mostly as my bedroom windows are in a fenced area in the middle of the house so I didn't put curtains on my bedroom or bathroom. But one day my son was playing under the carport and Jay pulled up in his truck. He was going to take a look at my car for me. Jay didn't make it to the carport before my eldest son says to me that hey I, I saw him in my window last night. Later that night I talked to my son about this and he told me that he did see him out of a window. I asked him if it was the kitchen window because you can see his horse pasture and he stops to feed them every morning and night. Chalking it up to that I didn't think much else about it but other things began to happen too. I guess you could say that I wanted him to be the person that I thought he was so I just kind of overlooked a lot. But a couple of strange things began to happen, like my favourite candy just somehow appeared in my fridge one day after school. My mum told me that she remembered me telling Jay that it was my favourite too. Someone sent me flowers every Friday for a couple of months, and I thought it was my ex or possibly my boyfriend at the time, but neither man would admit to it. My boyfriend jokingly told me that it must have been Jay too. The next day, I, I came home from school and my mum had the boys playing under the carport and Jay was working on my car. And my air suspension had a leak and Jay offered to take a look at it before I took it all the way to Tallahassee for the expensive repair. I got out of my mum's car and he asked me if I wanted to see the leak that he'd found. As I bent down over the hood, Jay stepped back at this point and when I turned around, I commented jokingly on his 90s era cell phone. He, uh had it in his hand for some reason and it's the type that you just don't see anymore like a, a very early camera flip phone if you catch my drift but later that night we came inside and my mum told me that she could have sworn that jay had taken a picture of me on his phone i know it sounds crazy but i uh i just didn't believe her this man was seriously always friendly and never any weird vibes from him whatsoever if I offered to pay him to, it was rare that he would ever accept any money. I should have known that people just aren't like that these days, but I guess I was just pretty naive at the time. Anyway, uh, a couple of weeks later, I was out mowing my courtyard and it was grown up pretty bad. And as I got close to my window, my heart literally sank into my butt. I had a newly placed center block outside both my windows and my bathroom window. I can't tell you how I knew, but I knew at that point that I had made a huge mistake and everyone was just right about Jay. I called my friend and neighbor Josh to come and look at the center blocks and he ran home and got a deer cam attaching it to a tree outside my window. This was at about 3pm in the afternoon, I think. That night too, I came home around 6 and was unloading the boys when I turned around and Jay was standing there. And... He said, hey, he didn't mean to scare you. I heard your mama was out of town. I said, yes, sir. And I knew that he knew because they're friends on Facebook and whatnot. And he told me to call him if I got scared or needed anything. I got the boys inside and we got snuggled into bed and they fell asleep in my bed when I realized that I had missed Sunday's episode of Game of Thrones. It was a good one too. The dragon died. So I went to my mum's bed to watch. I was laying there just talking to my ex-husband about the boys and the show when Josh called. 
I clicked over and he asked if my boyfriend was over and I told him no. This is at 9.02pm mind you and he told me that there was a man outside of my window. The deer cam apparently snapped the first picture at 9.02pm. My boys are in my room sleeping and Josh told me not to worry and that he was already coming up the driveway and to meet him outside, the other side of the house. The fear and dread just literally ran straight through me though. I slowly walked into my room and calmly scooped up my boys and I shut that door and just sprinted through the house as fast as I could. We sat in Josh's truck until the police arrived and the deer cam snapped photos at 9.02, 9.22 and 9.30. Which means that he apparently just stood outside of my window that long waiting for me to come back out. The police walked back into the field and could see where he was parking but he was already gone by this point. Behind the house is a, a massive produce field and it was a tractor road for tractor access and whatnot. I showed the police the photos and ID'd Jay and he was arrested at 2am that morning and when they went through his phone there were 9 months worth of pictures. There were pictures of me mowing, pictures of me playing with my kids, pictures of me playing in my bathroom, sleeping, bending over the hood of my car. He was just watching me all the time. I couldn't and didn't sleep for weeks after that and he ended up getting out of jail the following weekend and came into my mum's post office, she's a male lady, to tell her that he found my dog dead and he buried it for me. And even after all of that, he only received five years probation and a restraining order. And he uh, still lives right across the street. I stayed for maybe three months and after that I, I just got the hell out of it. Snart occurred about seven years ago on my way home from my parents. I was 22, young, naive and, well, uh, dumb. I just moved into my first apartment too. I was the first of my family to move away from our sleepy old train town that I grew up in. So I went home every Sunday to visit with the family but mostly to just do laundry and eat Sunday dinner and whatnot. I lived about 45 to 60 minutes up the highway too so I generally headed home by 6. On this night in particular, there was a, a summer thunderstorm that had been pouring down rain relentlessly all day long. My cousins dropped in just as I was packing up to leave after dinner, so I ended up sticking around for a few more hours to visit. I left my mum's around 10pm in the pouring rain, and this was the first time after moving from home that I encountered something that truly scared me. I don't know why I never told anyone about this, I, I think it had to be pride or something. I mean, everyone would always give me trouble about living alone as a single female in a newish area. Anyway, this is what happened. So, I left my parents around 10pm in the pouring rain. I'm driving down the service road that leads out of town and eventually turns into the on-ramp to the highway. As you're leaving town, the service road turns into one lane right in front of this quarry train loading station thing. I'm not really clear on what that place is, but it always gave me the creeps. If you're unfortunate enough to pass through when a train is crossing the road to load, you'll be stuck there for a while too. Once the road passes the tracks, it turns back into two lanes and goes up to a steep hill. As I'm approaching the quarry, I can make out these orange lights and a red cab 18-wheeler just sitting in the quarry parking lot. Mind you, it's pouring rain and visibility is low, so I can't make out the trucker until I'm pretty close to him. As soon as I could make out that it was a trucker, it pulled out onto the road. I had to slam on my brakes to avoid hitting the trailer on the back of the truck too, and I skid around on the road until I regained control of the car. Thanks for the driving air classes, mum. So, now I'm stuck behind this dummy that just pulled out without paying attention, I assume anyway. I keep my distance behind him because I'm a little flustered. But for the record too, my headlights were on, so if he had been paying attention, he should have been able to see me. But honestly, with the heavy rain and the low visibility, who knows, I guess. So, I'm behind this guy and we cross the tracks and begin to climb this steep hill. Despite it turning into two lanes on the hill, he's driving right up the middle of the two lanes. I figured he didn't realize that it was two lanes, so 
Uh, I just kind of putter along behind him, keeping my distance. As soon as he reaches the peak of the hill and the road begins to level out, he moves over to the right lane and I can finally go. So I move over and begin to pass him and as soon as I get past the front of the truck, he swerves behind me quite abruptly too and begins flashing his high beams at me. Usually when someone flashes their lights behind you, in our area or anyway, that means turn on your lights, but that mine were already on, and I checked as soon as he started flashing at me. But weirded out, I put my blinker on and safely changed lanes to get out of his way. But he follows my lane change and begins laying on his horn. The honking startled me, if I'm being honest, and I began to get a lot more flustered. I mean, what the hell did this guy want? I moved out of his way and my headlights are on, and... I was polite the whole time and didn't get in his way, so why didn't I just speed up and zip away, you may be asking? Well, I grew up in this area and it had been raining heavily all day long and I know that the service road floods a little in the heavy rain, both on the shoulders and in random spots in the middle of the lanes. It's a small western town and our roads are pretty bad. I had already skidded and nearly wrecked once and I wasn't about to floor it on this bumpy service road that floods and at risk wrecking again. There is nothing between the quarry and the highway too. Just about four or five miles of wooded area and if I wrecked, it would have just been him and me. So, this went on for the next four to five miles to the highway. He began tailgating me too in addition to the high beams and honking. But once the tailgating began, I was in tears and I didn't know what the hell this guy wanted from me and I'm just trying to stay out of his way and get home safely. I mean, that's all I wanted to do. I changed lanes two more times, making three total, and he followed me from lane to lane. As we approached the highway, I floored it, and he couldn't accelerate quickly enough to keep up, and I finally lost him. As soon as I realized that I had lost him and I was safe on the highway, I, I just lost it. I was a, a hysterical wreck, and... There's only one exit after getting on the highway to stop in the small town the highway runs through and after that it's just all wooded for a good 30 minutes. I thought about getting off at that exit just to calm down and pull it together but I just wanted to go home so I sped right past it. I should have stopped though. Once the city was no longer visible in my rearview mirror I was much more calm and I managed to scramble my cell out of my purse and put it in my lap just in case. The rain led up to a drizzle the further I went too, and I was still pretty on edge. But there were many other cars on the highway and majority of them were just truckers. I'm cruising along in the center lane when the truck next to me in the passing lane begins blaring the horn and moves into my lane forcing me over to the third lane. He continued moving over though, nearly forcing me off the highway and I sped up just in time and changed lanes right in front of him so that I'm back in the center lane. I slow down so that I'm in line with the front cab and I double click the button on my phone, a camera shortcut, and roll down my window. I start taking pictures of the cabbie and I think the flashes made him realize what I was doing and he began slowing down until he was behind me again. I got a lot of pictures mind you and I sped up and lost sight of him behind me. I was satisfied that I managed to get pics of him but I was just so angry at this point that I pulled over onto the shoulder of the highway to wait for him. I just wanted to get behind him so that I could get a pick of the license plate and report this guy. But sadly, he was on to me, for sure. Because I noticed headlights behind me, a long ways back, but behind me nonetheless. It was on the shoulder of the highway and I sat there and waited, keeping an eye on the truckers passing by me just to be sure that I didn't miss him. But then, I noticed a shadow pass through the headlights of the truck which, to be honest, spooked me quite a bit. I mean, did he just get out of the cab? Well, I didn't stick around to find out at this point. I took off and I got home as quickly as possible. The pictures were, unfortunately, a total failure. It was still drizzling and the flash combined with the drizzle just resulted in washing out of the pictures. I could see the red cab, but no matter what filters I used, there was no making out exactly what the cab said which means that there was nothing that I could really bring to the police to catch this guy. Which also means that this guy, he's still out there. The 
whole third floor of my house is a, a basement bonus room type thing where I watch TV. You can get in from the backyard through our door, which we always keep a wooden strip in the door making it unable to open. But we never take it out, and on the door to get down we hung a big decorative ring with a bunch of bells on it too, and they make a really loud noise and are sensitive to touch. So, the other day I was home alone just watching TV with all three of my dogs sitting in front of me on their bed. All of a sudden I heard the bells. It was as if someone was lightly opening the door or brushed by it or something. I was obviously terrified and tried to run through any possible scenario where the bells could have moved, but no one else was home and there were no windows open and all the dogs were right in front of me and I sat petrified for quite some time, too scared to go and check it out. Eventually though, I walked around and I didn't see anything. And this brings me to today. Five minutes ago, my mum was showing a friend our house and she came up from downstairs and told me that the screen door was cracked and the wood was out of the door. I honestly just cannot think of an explanation for why the bells rang and why the wood wouldn't be in the door, apart from someone being in the house with me. So I recently moved to a new city and I enjoy watching horror. I love the apartment that I have. It's a street facing unit in a renovated brownstone but I never open the curtains because there's a decent amount of foot traffic in the area. But the apartment comes with a PA system too that looks like a, an old school landline that I can use to buzz in visitors through the front doors of the building and through the vestibule. But my apartment is right by the entrance so I can hear people open and close the doors to the building too. My schedule is pretty erratic and I'm home at weird times of the day which makes this even more unnerving. So a couple of weird incidences happened prior to this night that I just kind of brushed off. First the phone would ring at just random hours, only a few times before it stopped and it would happen with no pattern at 3am or in broad daylight and just really random times. I would ignore it since I wasn't expecting visitors and I chalked it up to someone having the wrong number or phone or room or something. But following this, one night at around 2am, someone called the PA phone and when I ignored it, they kept calling every few minutes. In between calls, I could hear tapping on my window and banging on the entrance to the building. This went on for an hour or so before they just gave up. Again, I figured it was just a drunk person who forgot their keys and I felt bad but I lived by myself and I figured it would be a bad idea to let someone in the building that I didn't know, right? But management has an emergency number so if they had called that, they would have been let in anyway. So, the final event is, as I mentioned, I enjoy horror. I was watching an episode of The Haunting of the Hill House around 1am and as it ended, my cat sat up and just stared at the door. I'm thinking to myself, great, I'm haunted and wondering how much longer I have left to live when I realize that someone is trying to quietly turn my doorknob to see if it's unlocked. But the building and the door are pretty old too and the door has two deadbolts and a chain but the knob itself doesn't lock so I get up and for whatever reason grab a knife instead of calling the cops when the person tries to open the door again. Well, obviously the deadbolts held just fine, but the person just kept standing there, shuffling around and twisting the knob. I stood there, all five three of me, with this kitchen knife, listening to this person decide what to do and hear them walk away and exit the door to the vestibule, but not the building. I laid in bed awake for a few hours and I didn't hear them leave the building, so in the morning I waited until my neighbors left and then I started my day. I'm not sure if they were still in the building or not that whole time and we don't really have cameras here so there wasn't much that I could do to find out if they were actually there. But it freaks me out to think that they were possibly just waiting for me to come out and check or something so that they could strike. In the summer of 2015, I worked at a university in a small southern town. I lived a few miles away from campus in a two-bedroom house with a roommate and my schedule was pretty rigid. It was the same routine pretty much every day. I went to class in the morning, work in the afternoon and got home around 9pm. 
But one Thursday night, I arrived home at the usual time and noticed that there was an old pickup truck idling at the yield sign across the street from my house. I didn't know the make or the model, but it was beat up, peeling paint, rust, dents, and it looked uh, really out of place in our neighborhood. Most people there drove nice modern cars, so this thing just kind of stood out like a sore thumb. The streets were deserted, and it clearly wasn't waiting for any other cars to pass. I thought maybe the driver was just texting or something, but since my roommate wasn't home yet, I didn't want to leave the safety of my own vehicle. I'm a petite woman who doesn't carry pepper spray anymore, so I try to be aware of my surroundings. I pulled into my driveway and just sat there, staring at the truck and waiting for it to leave. Eventually it did, and it pulled away slowly and made its way out of the neighborhood toward the main road. When it was out of sight, I went inside, locked the door behind me, and made myself some dinner. By 11pm, my roommate still hadn't come home, and I was folding laundry and listening to podcasts in my bedroom. I'd forgotten all about the truck at this point, when suddenly, the lights went out. That spooked me, because normally our power didn't shut off unless there was bad weather or something. But that night was clear as a bell, so I immediately called my roommate and asked where he was. He told me that he was already on his way home, and he would be there in about five minutes. Relieved, I just told him to step on it and hung up, and no reason to freak out. I mean, it's just a power outage, right? I mean, he'd be there soon enough, and then we could figure it out together. I walked into the living room to wait for him, and our front door had a little diamond-shaped window in it, which I always hated, and I stood on my tiptoes and looked out to see if our neighbor's power was out as well. I was surprised to see, though, that it wasn't. Even the streetlight near our front yard was still on, which was weird. Had I somehow blown a fuse? Just as I considered making a trip to the basement to reset the breakers, I received a text message from my mum. I don't remember what it was about, but it only took me a few seconds to answer it. After I did, I looked out the window again quickly, and to my utter shock and surprise, there was a a man standing under the streetlight now. He hadn't been there before, and I instantly got a bit of a bad feeling. He was middle-aged and about six feet tall, I'd say, with a pot belly and little round glasses. Unkept hair, old sneakers, and his white t-shirt and blue jeans were absolutely filthy. I mean, he looked like he'd been working on a car or something. He was kind of mechanic dirty, if you know what I mean. And he had this awful, smug expression on his face. I'd never seen him before, and still in shock at actually seeing someone out there, I, I didn't move. Luckily, he couldn't see me because the inside of my house was pitch dark, but to my absolute horror, he was headed straight for me. And not walking quickly or with purpose, just kind of casually shuffling toward the house. If someone else were to pass by, they probably wouldn't have recognized what he was up to. He even glanced around a few times as if to make sure that nobody else was watching, and inch by inch he made his way into my yard. It was at this point that I realized that this guy was, he was coming to get me. I was sure of it, and I started to shake. I think it's worth mentioning too that my dog is very people orientated and usually goes bananas when he hears someone outside. But this time though, he was dead silent. He had no idea that there was a man approaching, even though I was staring at him through the window, and when the man was about halfway to the porch, my roommate's car finally rounded the bend and turned onto our street. As soon as those headlights lit him up, the man just turned to look and recognized the approaching vehicle. And my roommate and I both saw his face and he recognized that car and in his haste to get away he nearly stepped in front of it and got run over in fact. My roommate swerved into the driveway, scrambled out and charged into the house. He didn't even speak to me and he just grabbed the axe out of our utility closet and went back outside to confront the man. But by this time, the man was gone. We called the police and the power company and they both sent someone to check things out and the police didn't find anything, and the repairman reset the box in the pole near our house. Apparently, the switch had flipped, which is why our house, and only our house, was without electricity. I asked the repairman if there was any way that a person could have been responsible for that, but he didn't really give me a straight answer. The following day, we went on a camping trip that lasted all weekend, and if the man came back, we never knew. But after that, I refused to be home alone at any point. If... My roommate wasn't around when I got off work, 
I killed time at a local bar until he got back. And we moved away about a year later. I never saw the man or the truck again, but sometimes I wonder just how long he'd been watching our house for and what might have happened if my roommate hadn't have been on his way home that night. Moving to Michigan from North Carolina was a, a big change for all of us. But the climate was a huge difference for us since we weren't as used to the cold, along with having to start a new school and meeting new people too. However, there were other major differences as well, and these ones weren't as innocent. When we came to Michigan, our parents bought a one-story house that had originally come with two bedrooms, but with having three girls, our parents remodeled and added another room. The neighborhood was a friendly one with lots of children our own age to play around with, and it seemed like we had hit the jackpot with this home. At the time, I was the youngest, and when we moved, I was only five. But for the first two years of living there, things went great. Even with the third bedroom, my sisters and I still liked to sleep in the same bedroom, as we were all pretty close. Most nights, we would roughhouse around and watch TV until we were yelled at by our parents to go to bed. And the night the incident happened... We were doing exactly that. So it was late one night and my sisters were on the bed just roughhousing. That particular night we were watching Ghost Hunters and I had gotten up to use the bathroom. I'm not sure what caused me to look out the window but I just felt like something was watching me and as I turned my head to look out, the fear just froze me to the spot. It was like being in a nightmare and not being able to do anything as a face stared back at me. And it was enough to send ice cold shivers down my body in a knot to build up in my throat. I wasn't sure what to do too. I mean, do I call my sisters and then they think I'm crazy? What if the person behind the window just tried breaking through though? I was completely terrified as I looked into the man's face as he stared right back at me. He had no expression on his face, only blank eyes that would keep me awake for nights to come. With a sudden burst of courage though, I managed to get out a meek whisper. Uh, guys, uh, there's someone at the window. Of course, my first fear was correct and my older sisters didn't believe me. They thought that I was playing a joke on them as I kept an eye on the face, making sure it wouldn't disappear, but at the same time wishing it would. Finally, after convincing them to just take a look, they both got up and saw him. My older sister ran for our father as my sister and I just both stood there in fright, unsure what to do. My dad had woken up and, along with our trusty black lab, Wolf Mick, Susie, he managed to chase the man away. Our dad called the cops, but they told us that since he hadn't tried to break in or hurt us, that there wasn't much that they could do. We started locking the doors after that too. After this incident, we began to question the neighbors and they all responded the same. The family with the fence around their property had an adult son who was mentally disabled who would go around the neighborhood and look into girls' windows. It had even gotten so bad with one of the neighborhood girls that her father had made a bat with nails sticking out of it as a threat for what could happen if this man tried to come back to his home. My parents took this serious and proceeded to put inside locks and dark curtains on our window so that he couldn't see through. It seemed like the man had gotten the hint and we didn't have any more encounters after that. That is, until one night... My older sister was a young teenager at the time, had just gotten out of the shower and was about to get dressed and she heard a noise at her window. She decided to stay in her tower to take a glance at the window and to see what the noise was when she saw the man's face looking back at her. She screamed for my parents and immediately left her room. My dad was quick as a whip up with a baseball bat and going after the man with Susie on his heels. My dad had let Susie go ahead of him with one marching order too, get him. Being the loyal dog that she was, Susie took after the man and bit his ankle taking him down. But while this was all happening, my mum was on the phone with the police who were on their way. And with help from Susie, our dad had captured the man and held him there until the cops showed up. They arrested him, but because of his disability, he was let go the following day. My parents were absolutely furious. They couldn't understand how the police could just let someone off who had been caught multiple times trespassing into people's yards and looking into younger girls' windows. They, along with the other neighbours, set up a neighbourhood watch after that and they made sure that us kids were watched 24-7 and that no harm would come to us. Something that should be known too about my father is that he's an ex-marine who developed PTSD with one of the side effects being insomnia. 
My dad had taken advantage of this during these incidences, and he would keep watch of the house and constantly would check the yard for the man. This helped us kids to feel safer because we knew with our dad watching us that we'd be safe. It had been barely ever a week since the man had looked into my sister's room when he came again. This time, it was only my middle sister and I in our room, and it was early evening and my parents and their friend were hanging out in the living room. We had an early bedtime because it was a school night, so we were both in bed about to fall asleep when we began to hear this noise like someone was trying to get in. Fear immediately gripped both my sister and I as we both knew what was most likely happening. Her, being older and more brave, she jumped out of bed and ran to tell the adults what was happening. I, however, was once again frozen in fear as I could hear the man trying to force open our locked window. I could do nothing more than just hide under my covers and hope that he couldn't get in. It wasn't long before the adults were in the room looking out the window though and my mum came to comfort me while my dad checked things out. Since it was winter out, my dad could see the man's footprints below our window along with handprints on our window. His temper immediately flared as he told my mum to call the cops again and he decided to take matters into his own hands and walked over to the man's house. But while there, he told the man's parents what their son had been doing and that the cops were already on their way. He made sure this time that the man was arrested and pressed charges. But to this day, my sisters and I are still scared by what happened. We refuse to have any of the windows left uncovered and we make sure that they're locked. And we always make sure the doors are locked too. I'm not quite sure whatever happened to him after he was arrested, but there was never again a face in our window after that. And for that, I'm very thankful. So there's a guy in my building who I chat to in the lift or if we pass each other in the halls, etc. I'm pretty certain that he's uh, big into drugs, but don't know if it's just weed or if he's into harder stuff, but, you know, not my business and all. Anyway... He's probably like late 30s, maybe early 40s. I'm 24. He's heavily tattooed and built like a tank. And last night, he knocked on my door and asked if I wanted to go for a drink sometime and gave me his number. I mentioned that I had a boyfriend, but I said sure as friends that we could potentially, as he always seemed pretty nice to me. But I just came across his Facebook page, as I think your phone links up for friend suggestions and whatnot, so I had a bit of a stalk. And... He wrote a, a public Facebook status about asking me out and things like, can't wait to smash those holes. And mind you, that was the nicest and cleanest one too. He also had a post about liking to choke women during sex and sometimes going too far and kinky stuff like that. But what really weirded me out though is that I had a really obscure song from the 80s in my head a couple of weeks ago, so I was singing it in my flat and... He uh, posted it with like the caption, thinking of her, but like, he lives about 10 doors down and he would only have been able to hear me if he was like, stood outside my door or uh, on my balcony or something. He was the only person in the building that I seemed to see too and I, uh, I see him everywhere, which is how we got talking in the first place because he thought it was a funny coincidence. But now, I'm not so sure. Also, I just googled him and he was in an archive for a local newspaper site and apparently he was arrested for assaulting a police officer last year. This literally happened this week and it still terrifies me. Me and my family were on holiday and we were doing some clothes shopping in the mall. We had driven for a fair amount of time so we all decided to stop at the bathrooms too. As per usual, the girls' toilets have a queue, whereas the male toilets had no line. So me and my mum were waiting in line while my younger brother had gone in, finished, and gone outside to wait. My brother was outside on his own for around five minutes, I'd say, and he's 15, so this isn't any problem. When we come out, we all head off to go to another shop when we hear a man shouting at my brother aggressively. We all turn around and... This man was poking my brother in the chest, getting up in his face and shouting things at him like, you need to get this stuff off your phone and you're a sicko. Visibly, my brother is confused and with him being pretty much the sweetest guy that you could ever meet, 
But me and my mum knew that whatever this guy is accusing him of, he has something wrong for sure. Eventually, we get the guy to calm down and explain what's going on. He starts spouting off about how that game that he's playing hurts me and he's causing me damage. He's a sicko. And this is where my mum stepped in to try and figure out what game it was and what he was doing. But the guy couldn't tell us which was red flag number one and it was where this encounter began to go from creepy to just unnerving. I mean, how come he can't tell us what game is hurting him or tell us anything about it? He starts pulling at his trouser legs and showing us his legs, pointing at them saying, this is what people like you have done to me. I try and show the doctors but they send me to psych every time. The thing is is that, that there was nothing wrong with this dude's legs at all. But they were normal looking legs with no sign of harm or injury anywhere, as this man was saying. Me and my mum just kind of look at each other with an, are you seeing this too kind of look, as we both thought that we were missing something major. But then, he starts to almost threaten us by saying, You know, I could have a hammer and I could attack you right now. In fact, I should because of what you did to me. The hammer thing goes on for a while too, and he gestures hitting my brother across the face with a hammer for most of it. Eventually, we manage to leave by just apologizing and walking away quickly. It seemed like going along with this guy's accusations would make him stop harassing us, and it made me really sad because, obviously, this man needed help that he obviously wasn't getting, and it's left my brother slightly terrified about going places without us nearby. But it makes me wonder, what if the situation had escalated? Or what if he had done it to someone who wasn't so calm? He certainly wasn't stable, and I often wonder if maybe he really did have a hammer somewhere. After high school, I needed a job to pay for college, and the local funeral home was hiring, so I applied and got the job. I was young and in good shape and somewhat handsome. This isn't bragging, it's kind of important for the story really. So about two years into working for the funeral home, I went to the house to do a removal. It was for the husband of a lady that we called Becky. Becky was in her late 30s or 40s and her husband died of an OD and it was really shocking for her. Part of my job was to comfort the family and let them know that we were there for them. Well, Becky took it way too far. After I left the house with her husband and went to the funeral home to prepare the body for a funeral, I was getting ready to leave to go home. Becky was outside waiting and nothing seemed too weird. Normally families come in later in the day to make arrangements for the funeral and whatnot, so it was all pretty standard. Becky talked to me and it seemed off how she just looked at me. After a few minutes of conversation, I got in my car and went home. A few days later, we had the funeral and Becky hugged and thanked me for the service. And that's kind of when it gets weird. She grabbed my butt. Not in a sexual way, but just like her, her hand went there. A few days later, I was leaving my house and Becky's car was out in my driveway. But this happened a few times over the next few weeks too and then she showed up at my university. She somehow found my Instagram and phone number too, and she would text me several times a week. I thought that she was just grieving and attaching herself to the person that she saw after a tragic event, but she just wouldn't stop. After having her follow me to pick up my girlfriend one time, I decided that it was enough. I called the cops, but by this time she was gone. And a few weeks later, Becky was arrested for assaulting someone pretty badly too. Fort Bragg, California is a, a small beach town northwest of Sacramento. It has a, a kind of Stephen King feel to it. You know what I mean? That kind of misty, almost eerie small harbor town, but it's beautiful and a huge tourist attraction. You get people from all over the US that travel here in fact. And my fiancé and I decided to drive up there after I had to take some time off work due to stress and whatnot. It was a last minute decision and we actually packed up our bags in less than 10 minutes, grabbed our dog and we just kind of took off. But if we wouldn't have had our dog with us, 
I'm pretty sure that I would have lost her. And I guess this is where I tell the story, right? So, it's our second day here right now, and we're staying at a motel that overlooks the ocean. You can see the fog roll in during the early hours of the morning, and watch the fishing boats leave the harbour to go get their haul for the day and whatnot. It really is a beautiful thing to see, and we woke up early, and I was craving, and I mean craving, eggs and bacon. After getting dressed and deciding what spot to stuff our faces at, we left for our morning adventure. See, here's where I made my mistake. I was driving down the road and it looked like the stop that we crawled up to was a four-way stop sign. I clearly guessed wrong though because when I pulled out and cut off a small Ford Ranger with a dinky trailer attached to it and two old men driving, I realized that it was a little too late that I'd cut them off. They threw up their hands and pointed at me, but Lily didn't even notice it. I threw up my hands in a sort of sorry I'm just a tourist kind of way and they just kind of stared me down. It was a hillbilly standoff that George Strait would be proud of. But I didn't think much of it and just kept driving down the foggy two lane road to get breakfast. I didn't even think to say anything to her about it and I just never thought I'd see them again and I didn't want her to complain about me not knowing where to drive and how to drive and whatnot. But I was really wrong though. I was wrong and I'll never forget what happened next. So we got back to the motel after a not so great but overly expensive breakfast. We cuddled up and talked about our plans for the wedding, what we wanted to do after the wedding and midway through our life plan she realized that we were out of dog food to feed Bruce. I agreed to go up to the cute but creepy market and grab a bag of goodies, kissed her on the cheek and jumped in the car and left and got about halfway to the store before I realized that I'd actually forgot my wallet on the nightstand. When I pulled back into the parking lot though, I, I saw it. That same Ford Ranger with the janky trailer attached to it. The only difference was that Hank and Boomhauer, they weren't inside of it. I don't remember seeing them here last night, I thought. Well, I, I walked up to our door while looking over my shoulder wondering, what are the chances that these douchebags are staying here and... Then, not two seconds later, my heart started beating faster. Our motel door was open, but just barely cracked. It was open just slightly enough to the point where you could see a sliver of light, but nothing more. I slowly pushed it open and looked inside, but I didn't see anything. Lily and Bruce, they were both gone. And it was kind of like they were never really there at all. My heart started racing and I dropped my keys on the floor and ran outside, heart pounding in my chest faster than a jackhammer in New York. I didn't see the creepy old guys from the Ford truck or my fiancé outside and I was becoming angry and frantic by this point. I thought to myself, where are you guys? Before the screaming inside my head was cut off by the sound of a familiar barking. I heard Bruce barking and so I ran. I ran faster than I've ever run in my entire 28 years of my life too. I ran straight over to the front office where the sound was coming from and that's when I saw her and our dog just inside the office. And she was crying, sitting on the floor sobbing uncontrollably. And his hair was standing straight up until he saw that it was me sprinting towards them. Lily got up and ran into my arms and meanwhile the clerk was on the phone and I'm wondering what the heck just happened in the two minutes that I was gone. I asked her what was going on and this is what she told me, and it makes my blood run cold. So, it turns out as soon as I left, not 30 seconds went by and these guys knocked on the door. Lily opened it thinking that it was me forgetting something, which I did, and they tried to force their way into the room and one of them said, you can thank your boy toy for what's coming to you, while grabbing her and covering her mouth, but these guys, they didn't realize something, that... We had a dog in our back seat when I cut them off. Bruce jumped off the bed and didn't hesitate to bite the one grabbing her. They kicked him and tried to shake him off, but he wouldn't let go. After being bit and realizing that the noise would draw attention if they didn't leave, they ran off and Lily was able to run to the front office and wait for help, and Bruce followed suit. I wasn't there and I couldn't protect her, and if we would have had a dog sitter, she would probably be gone right now. My dog was there and he did exactly what a good boy should do. No, the best boy would do. And for that, he truly is my best friend. 
If he wasn't there, though, what would have happened? Would she have been kidnapped, beaten, killed, all of the above? But the craziest thing is that they still haven't been caught yet. We filed all the reports with the local sheriff and I told them what happened earlier that morning and the cop looked right at me and said, you're lucky your dog was there. If he wasn't and they got in there with her, you could have been filling in a different report right now. I got tears in my eyes at that and I looked over at Lily and Bruce and thank God that I rescued him from the pound. Because in return, he rescued the love of my life when I couldn't. Hey guys, uh, so this event is still ongoing, but I was hoping to seek some advice from you guys because honestly, I have no idea what to do. But to begin, I've always had this feeling that someone was watching me ever since I moved into my family house eight years ago. At first, I thought I just watched too much ID investigation and I was just being paranoid or something. But I couldn't help looking over my shoulder when I would walk to school or to my bus stop. When I would walk to school too, I was always scared in the mornings when it could be dark during the winter or fall because where I live is just so vast country lands. I live in Canada and although not much crime happens in my neighborhood, I never could rid myself of this eerie feeling. Even when I would come home from school, being home alone just didn't help. I would triple check my windows and locks to make sure everything was locked. However, in my basement, our garage door would never fully lock since the door hinge was broken and detached from the door, therefore it would never properly close and whatnot. I always told my dad to fix this door, but because he would always go away for work, he never found the time to do so. Stupidly, I thought nothing bad would happen since my garage needed a four-digit passcode to get in. On a side note though, I just want to let everyone know that never, under any circumstances, put your birthday as your passcode for anything. Even if you switch up the date so that the day is first and then the month is second, just do not do it because it's so obvious. Anyway, my theory is that he uh, knew my passcode to my house and therefore he had free reign for seven years to go through my things. At first I thought I was just being forgetful. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my underwear somewhere or something. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my favorite top or maybe my dad accidentally donated it or something. But I should have known better. During my four years in high school, he never really contacted me and it was when I went to university that things started to change. Since I lived in the countryside, I decided to go to university an hour away. My dad did not want me to live on residence because he didn't want to leave the house unattended for long periods of time. So, we came to the conclusion that it would be best if I drive to and from school. Now, I would leave for university very early in the morning, around 6am, and would come back at around 6pm at night. I stopped being aware of my surroundings at this time too, because I would just be tired from my 12 hour days and now that I wasn't walking alone, everything should be fine. When I would come home from university, I would find certain things moved in my house though, not that I'm a neat freak and I might have mild OCD or something, so I like things in a particular way in my house, but little things like my makeup or candles would be moved and I thought it was odd and would frequently bring it up to my dad, but he would just say that it must have been me who was doing it. But I knew for certain that it wasn't me. During my second and third year in university, I started to get weird notes in my mailbox too. But the writing on these notes looked uh, almost childlike and it would always be written in blue ink. I have those country style mailboxes at the end of my driveway where the little red flag goes up whenever we get mail too. And uh, from my way back from university I would always check the mail and sometimes I would find these letters. The letters would never be long, in fact they would only be one to three sentences that would contain just really odd questions like, where are you? I wonder what you do while you're away from home. How do you find university? It must be tiring driving that long. Did you make new friends? Do you still hang out with your best friend? You dress differently now. Why is that? I miss the scarves that you used to wear and you don't close your curtains as much anymore. Why don't you look for me? These letters would always come once a month at the beginning of the month too and 
Uh, I would show my dad, and at first he would say, no, maybe your cousins are just pranking you, or it's possibly just your friends. But every time I would ask my friends or cousins, they would give me this confused response saying that they never sent me any letters. Now that I'm in my fourth year at university, the letters, they don't come as frequently, but two weeks ago, something happened that makes me think that things may be escalating. So I came back home from university at 7.45pm and it was fairly dark outside. I saw that my mailbox flag was up so I checked the mail and it was just bills. At this point, I haven't gotten a note for a little over three months now so I'm thinking that maybe the notes just won't come anymore. As I settle in for bed, I change into my pyjamas and I check the locks as I usually do and as I checked my front door lock, I looked at the glass panel of my door and... I saw that the red flag of my mailbox is up. It's 10.30 at night, mind you, and there's no way the mail could have gotten dropped off, and plus I, I checked the mail. I'm certain of that. I call my dad and tell him about it, and he said not to freak out and that maybe one of our neighbours accidentally got our mail and just dropped it off since this happens sometimes and I shouldn't worry. I stay on the phone with my dad as I quickly run down my driveway to check my mailbox and as I open the mailbox, I feel my heart drop because it's a, an unmarked manila envelope. I quickly run back inside and I open the manila envelope and although there's no written note, I find something even more disturbing. It's a pair of my old blue panties that I haven't seen in years. At this point, I scream and my dad tells me to hang up and call my aunt, who is actually a police officer. My aunt comes over and checks the inside and outside of my house, but she can't find anything. She tries to jog my memory and asks if I know anyone who could be doing this, but I honestly have no clue. My aunt told me to keep any more letters that I get and she's been staying with me the days that my dad is out for work. My dad is thinking about installing security cameras and hopefully we can catch whoever is doing this. But what else can I do? I'm so paranoid and scared because I don't know who this person is, but I know he or she has been stalking me for a long time now. Those panties that he sent me were ones that I had while I was in high school and I lost that pair when I was in grade 10. But the fear of the unknown is getting me so much that... My anxiety is just isn't letting me function normal. I can't sleep, I'm struggling to eat, I, uh, I just can't focus. And I just don't know what to do. I've been a nurse now for seven years and I absolutely love it. Back when I was in school, besides your clinicals where you did rotation in every unit, labor and delivery and psych, etc., you had a month-long unpaid internship if you passed your exams and were slated for graduation. But the internships were given out by the head instructor and it went alphabetically and my last name ends with T, so I was at the tail end. All the internships that I wanted, emergency and med surge and all that, they'd be taken by this point. The instructor told me though that we have a psych internship at a major psychiatric facility and you're a big strapping guy, I'm sure you'll be perfect for it. <laughs> Great, psych. I wasn't thrilled and I had no interest in psych but I needed the hours to graduate and I figured that I'd at least have some stories to tell my buddies over some beers. But boy, I had no idea. The hospital I interned at is quite well known, so I'm not going to go into too many specifics, but it has a psych ward that deals with many different psychiatric disorders. There's a few floors, and they had a rehab as well as a clinic for eating disorders. The floor that I was assigned to was the children's psychiatric ward, so children below 18 with all kinds of issues. Since I wasn't licensed yet, I didn't distribute medication or really do anything besides work as a glorified orderly. Some of the kids were pretty awesome though and they had severe autism or other issues but they were still great kids. But then, then there was Adam and he was diagnosed with RAD as well as a bevy of psychological issues. He was 10 but had tried to kill his 6 year old sister, punched his mum so hard that he knocked her unconscious, killed the family cat 
And there were some other things too. He was not allowed general access, not allowed to do craft hour, access to scissors and all that. And he was allowed an hour of free time where I or another staff member brought him to a small atrium where he'd run in circles or kick a half deflated soccer ball or something. Well, one day, it's raining and the atrium is a no-go, so I was told that I could let him in the small nurse's lounge. But the charge nurse swore that she removed any weapons that he could have used, so I brought him in there and while he sat in the corner and talked to himself, I sat in a chair and waited. I get radioed from an orderly, so I take my eyes off Adam for a millisecond, and the next thing I know, a chair is violently launched at me. It hits me square in the face and I go down pretty hard. I was stunned but not knocked out and suddenly there's a 10 year old 80 pound kid on top of me hell bent on killing me. Luckily he was easily distracted and at the exact moment the charge nurse came into the lounge probably to get coffee. I was able to flip him over and get him subdued and the charge nurse almost wets herself and then starts apologizing. I ended up with a broken nose and some pretty bad bruises and the head nurse was slapped on the wrist and my ass was kissed the next two weeks. Surprisingly though, besides Adam and a few others, that place made such an impact on me after I graduated and became certified that I ended up working there for four years. And so, I have many more stories from my time there, but I'll finish with this one for now. Oh, and uh, by the way... Last I heard, Adam was in a long-term facility, and with meds, he's doing okay now. I had a stalker growing up, and she lived in my neighborhood with her parents. She's an adult living with her parents and not a child. I used to ride my bike around the neighborhood and would always pass her house. Every time I passed her house, I would notice that she would come outside and just watch me, if... She wasn't already there, that is. I never really thought anything of it because, well, I was young. Her watching me turned into her trying to talk to me, but of course I would just ignore her because I didn't know her. Then she would follow me wherever I rode my bike, and now I was getting pretty freaked out, I must admit. I mean, why the heck was this woman that I didn't know following me? And that turned into her following me to my house and asking if she could come in. I eventually stopped riding my bike altogether, so this lady stopped doing what she was doing. I'm 14 now, still living in the same neighborhood, and she's back. It all started with her coming to our door and knocking on it. I remembered her and immediately started freaking out. Her knocking turned into her banging and violently shaking at the doorknob whilst yelling. She knew our names and she yells hi, my name, or hi, my mum's name, and I have no clue how she knows our names. Neither me or my mum have ever spoken to her in our lives. But the only way that she could know our names is if she asked the neighbours or something that know us or the landlord, which is really creepy. I mean, why couldn't she just have asked us ourselves for our names? Well... One night, my mum is getting ready to head out to do the laundry at the laundromat near our house. My mum unlocks the door and then goes into the living room where I am and the lady had pushed the door open, came into our house and just started to walk into our living room. And my mum yelled at her and pushed her out, slamming and locking the door. This must have meant that she was waiting for the door to be unlocked or waiting for one of us to come outside or it could have been a coincidence I guess but I don't know. My mum left eventually and as she was walking into the laundromat, the lady was walking behind her but my mum noticed and slammed the door so that she couldn't get in. It was 12am at this point and I was folding the clothes and I hear banging on the door and well, what do you know, of course it's her again. I checked the peephole and I can see her running away as if she knew that I was there. Now it was maybe 2 or 3am and I was in the living room again because I couldn't sleep and I hear something moving in the grass behind my house. I checked to see what it was and it was the lady. She was crouched down in the grass and ran away as she saw me looking at her. And this has been happening every night ever since then. I've also been hearing a few people stand in our front yard lately, talking to each other quite often, late at night, but... I'm not sure if that has anything to do with this woman or not. 
I think this might be happening to our neighbours as well because I heard them talking about a stalker a couple of times. I remember them saying something along the lines of, go away you neighbourhood stalker one night. I have no idea why this started up again, but boy, do I wish it hadn't. This story happened about a year and a half ago, I think. I've only ever shared this story with one other person too, the other person who is actually in this story. But first, uh, a little bit about me. I have a formal education in the hard sciences and I'm halfway through a Doctor of Medicine degree program, so those are the lenses through which I see the world. But this makes me a, a natural skeptic, I guess you could say, on most things. But... I firmly believe in the existence of extraterrestrial life because the vastness of the universe makes it a mathematical certainty, but I'm far less convinced on the subject of uh, UFOs, although there are a number of well-documented events that keep me from dismissing them outright. This story has nothing to do with aliens, though. At least I, I don't think it does. I guess I only mention it for the purposes of demonstrating that I keep an open mind on things, but that I still need to see at least some sort of suggestive evidence. I'm a huge fan of the paranormal as a genre, though, and I find the stories and media fun and entertaining. I like being scared, and I enjoy the experience of reflecting on what if. But it's always been just that to me, just a genre of entertainment. But then, this happened, and... I still can't explain it. So my fiancé and I grew up and live in a small city in New England. Honestly, it's really only a city by definition. It's bigger than your average New England town, but it's far more suburban than your average city. The house my family has lived in since I was two is located on the outskirts of the city as well. I'm now almost 30, and although my fiancé and I live in an apartment below her mum's place, I still keep a lot of my stuff there at my old house, including my motorcycle and some other things. When you pull out of the driveway and go one way, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to get into the city proper, but if you go the other way, it takes about two minutes to hit farmland. Heading towards the farms, you end up on a road called Pine Hill Road. On this road is a, a very old cemetery with gravestones that date back as far as the 1700s. The cemetery encompasses a, a square plot of land bordered on three sides by trees and by Pine Hill Road on the fourth. The official name of this cemetery is called Pine Hill Cemetery, but everybody in the whole area calls it by its other name, Blood Cemetery. It is allegedly one of the most haunted cemeteries in all of New England. The name derives from the Blood family burial plot, located more or less in the center of the grounds and is where most of the alleged activity arises from. Tangibly, the Blood headstone is engraved with the image of a hand, and it is said that during the day, this hand points upwards towards the heavens, while at night, it points downwards towards the ground. It is said that the ghost of Abel Blood roams the grounds too. It's actually illegal to enter a cemetery at night here and the police do patrol this area because of just how frequently people try to go in at night to see for themselves and whatnot. I personally have never actually been inside the grounds day or night, not even during the experience that I'm about to describe. But by the way too, I've used the real name of the place so feel free to google this cemetery all you want. That way you'll know that I'm talking about a real place with real stories attached to it. And... But what I'm about to describe to you is definitely no creepypasta. This really did happen to me. I've driven past this cemetery, uh, must have been a million times before, day and night, and not once have I ever seen or experienced anything out of the ordinary. That is, not until one night last fall. It must have been around... Uh, uh, late August, I think, or early September, 2017, when summer was on its way out and fall was just starting to let everyone know that it was on its way. It was late and dark one night when my fiancé and I were out for a ride on my motorcycle. We love riding around this area because there's little traffic, the roads are just windy enough to make it fun, and the farms are really beautiful. So... We were riding up Pine Hill Road and we were just beginning to pass blood on the left as we've done so many times before. Going about 30 miles per hour and it must have only taken 3-5 to five seconds to pass the whole property. But this time, something really strange happened to me. 
time just uh, appeared to slow down, and then something red reflected across the visor of my helmet. I turned my head to the left, and this is what I saw. Up in a tree just along the left border of the cemetery, there was a, a floating orb of the brightest red light that I've ever seen. So bright that its center was pretty much white. And orb isn't really the right way to describe it. Because it wasn't just a sphere of red light. It looked like it was kind of oozing and dripping. Like it was made of plasma or something. The best way that I can think to describe it as is that it looked kind of like a, a tip of a signal flare when it's held off the ground. It was that bright and it was oozing like the tip of a flare but it was not shooting out from somewhere like a flare does. But where a flare has a sort of elongated shape from the spark shooting out at the end, this was definitely circular. And unlike a flare, there was no visible physical object from which this dripping and burning orb emanated from. It was just there, sitting there. It was bright and it was oozing and it was dripping and it was floating up in a tree. I really can't underscore enough just how bright this thing was too. And then I noticed the rest. Moving around this orb was a, a set of hands. I didn't notice them at first because of how bright the orb was and how dark the world was, but as my eyes began to focus somewhat, I realized that there was something else in the tree with the orb, and it looked like it was actually conjuring the orb or something. The thing was humanoid looking, but it didn't look human at all. It looked like a, a scrawny and lanky ET phone home sort of thing with nubby joints and fingers and features, but with scrawny limbs. Its face was long, narrow at the top and bottom, but wide in the middle, and it was bumpy. It was a face unlike any human face that I've ever seen before, and in my profession I've seen a lot of deformed faces before, and this thing's face just looked like it was from hell. Its skin looked dark brown, and it appeared to be wearing some sort of baggy looking cloak. Its legs were crossed, and its hands were circling around this extremely bright oozing red orb, and it was hovering a few inches over a branch in the tree. Passing the cemetery on my motorcycle that night just felt like the longest three to five seconds of my entire life as well. As we came to the other end of the cemetery, time appeared to resume itself as normal and I looked back over my shoulder and it was gone. Stunned, I looked back again and it was still gone. But twice more I looked back and twice more it was nowhere to be seen. I immediately pulled over and my fiance asked me what was wrong because she knows I never pull my bike over to the side of the road unless something is up and I have to, especially when it's dark and especially not on these windy roads where people tend to drive like a bat out of hell. Hey, did you see that back there? I asked her. See what? She asked me. That red light that we passed back at the cemetery just now. Red light? She asked, a little confused. Turns out she hadn't seen a damn thing nothing. I explained to her what I had just seen or experienced or whatever it was that had happened and she believed me noting how I looked visibly disturbed by something but whatever that something was she didn't see any of it. It was dark and we were moving so normally I wouldn't have been so surprised by her not seeing something like a figure up in a tree that we'd passed but that orb of light it was just so damn bright that you couldn't miss it. But mind you, there were definitely no cars around, no houses from which a porch light could have been peering through those particular trees, and there were no lights in the sky, no planes, no helicopters around, and just no explanation as to why I saw this. I've never been diagnosed with any mental illness too, and I don't have a substance abuse problem and definitely wouldn't have myself and the mother of my future children together on a bloody motorcycle if I was high or drunk. I've never had a seizure or been told that I've had a seizure and I've never had hallucinations before and I've never experienced anything like this. I've driven past blood numerous times since then too and every time it's just been its normal old sleepy self. To this day, I still just have no idea what the hell that was. To 
two years ago. I bought a house and I stayed there by myself for two weeks before my roommate moved in. And during this time, my brother was staying with me because, well, the house is haunted. Then my roommate moved in and about a month in, my brother and my roommate actually started dating. So one night, I was in bed around 2 to 3 a.m. and my roommate came into my room and she just stopped and looked at me for a moment. So I, I said, hey Annie, and she just continued to stare at me but went into my bathroom. Around 15 minutes later, she was still in there but she never turned on the light so I watched the bathroom carefully. Around the time of me staring at the bathroom, my brother Aaron came into my room and said, hey did you hear that? So I turned my attention towards him and said, he what? And then my roommate came out from behind him saying, downstairs. I looked at the bathroom and then at her and said, when the hell did you get out of the bathroom? She looked at me like I was dumb and said, I never left my room. Well, obviously, my jaw dropped and I explained why I thought that she was in my bathroom. My brother then interjected and said that the cabinets slammed downstairs and they came upstairs to tell me about it and I was in disbelief. I was completely and utterly shocked so my brother told me to stay there and went downstairs to slam the cabinets to kind of see if I could hear it again and I heard it that time but I didn't hear it the first time for some reason. But another incident happened a few months ago which really creeped me out. My roommate was asleep and was having a nightmare and woke up crying but she was pretty silent and I was in my bedroom watching Supernatural and hadn't left my room in hours. The next morning she came into my room and said, why did you open my door and stare at me last night? I had no idea what she was talking about so I asked her and she explained that apparently I opened a door, peered in and just stared at her for a few moments while she was in the dark. She explained that the only reason she knew it was me was the fact that the laundry room light was on and she could see me. But I never left my bedroom and the laundry light, it wasn't on. And I didn't hear a door open or anything so I have no idea what's going on. My mum works for Olympus Medical Team, so she's always travelling around the northeast USA for work. She checked into a, a Ramada Inn in the outskirts of Buffalo, New York during a particular bad winter. She went to a conference that she was there to attend and she went through a drive through to get some dinner and went back to the hotel. She gave me a call on her way back and was telling me how busy that the day was and how she just wanted to get some sleep. That night after eating her dinner, she told me that she turned off all the lights and the TV so as to get as much sleep as she could so she could have a safer drive back down to Pittsburgh. Especially, I'm sure, since Lake Erie was producing a particularly intense lake effect snow system at that time. She said that she had fell asleep for an hour and a half or so when she heard something in the corner of the hotel near the bathroom. She said it startled her but she did her best to just write it off as someone in the hallway or something. A minute or so later and she told me that she shut her eyes again to go back to sleep and before she drifted back off however, she heard another noise that sounded like it was a little closer in the room. She explained that it wasn't as loud as the previous noise but it was a lot more worrying. She said that it kind of sounded as if the phone that was on the nightstand next to the bed had been moved a couple of inches. But it was after she heard this noise that the scary stuff began. She told me that it must have been less than a minute after she heard the noise that she actually felt the bed move. She explained she felt the side of the bed that was closest to the door depress as if somebody had just sat down on it. This obviously scared her. She told me that it was so scary that it was almost as if her body had the instinct to just kind of play dead and not pay any attention to it so that maybe whatever it was would just leave if she thought that she was still asleep. It was the same strategy that a child uses or I use to be honest when you pull the covers up over your head and pretend everything's okay. This however was not destined to be that night. My mum told me that she could then feel the bed moving as if whatever was sitting there was actually getting into the bed to lay down too. And while she was still playing possum 
she felt something touch her side. It was then that whatever this invisible being was rolled over top of her and onto the other side of the bed. After it got to the other side, she said it felt as if then it kind of sat up and just got off the bed. She told me that it happened really slowly too and that her body was getting pressed down into the mattress as it was rolling over her. She could actually feel the whole thing. She then jumped up, threw the light switch on, looked around and didn't find anything and immediately started to hyperventilate. Her peaceful night was over at that point and she immediately packed up her things and just checked out of that room. She started driving home early as she figured that taking on the lake effect snowstorm was safer than staying in that room for even one minute longer. My mum is definitely not one to make stuff up like this, especially something along these lines. And to be honest, I, I absolutely believe her 100%. To this day, she doesn't really know what it was or what happened and neither do I. I mean, we looked around a little bit to try and find some sort of information, but we're still stumped by the whole thing. Needless to say, my mum, she never stayed in that hotel ever again. In 2004, my family and I moved into a house in a town that we weren't really familiar with. My mother, myself, then 15, and my two young brothers loved the house from the get-go, though. It wasn't big from the outside, sitting terraced, connected to the two houses at the side. However, it was in a lovely cul-de-sac, so it didn't have much traffic, and right outside our door was a fenced area that kids could play football in. On the inside of the house was very spacious too, and it had a really nice feeling, if you believe in those sort of gut feelings anyway. After moving in, we met the neighbours and got familiar with the area. Sitting across from the cul-de-sac, right as you came into it, was a, a large four-storey building that looked uh, pretty old. On the top at the front, the opposite side to our house, it read Royal Infirmary. Some of the buildings were built in the 1830s, however, it was started as a, a full infirmary in 1905. There was another large old building sitting to the left of that building and it sat slightly behind some of the houses in our cul-de-sac. We got talking with the neighbours who informed us that the whole of the housing area was on the side of an old hospital. The big old buildings were the only remaining parts to the building apart from the front gate to the hospital which now stands in the car park of the shop across from the big building that they also claimed that the shop stands on what was once the morgue. However, I can't actually confirm that. Behind our house was a, a disused train line too and it was once one of the busiest lines in the area and carried inmates from insane asylums to the hospital for various treatments and whatnot. The line was completed in 1839 and it stopped being used for passengers in 1957 and stopped for goods transport in 1980. So, thinking it was pretty cool, 15 year old me didn't really see a problem with living on the side of an old hospital. But things got weird after a few days of just living there. My room was at the back of the house facing the train line and at night I I'd hear train horns and sometimes lights as if a train was passing, but when I get out of bed and go to the window, it would always stop. This became so frequent too that friends would say, well, there's the ghost train again, when they'd stay over and hear it. I'd often see a shadow running around that I thought was a cat at first, and I even checked under the beds to see if a cat had gone into the house whilst we had the door open or something. After a while, I started being allowed to have male friends to stay over on the sofas downstairs. Many of them, including my own husband now, complained to me about hearing a baby crying in the middle of the night. Yet, my brothers were too old for that and there wasn't any babies nearby. My now husband saw a shadow walk past the living room door once and thought it was me or my mum coming down to check on him, only to go out to the hallway and find no one there. Mind you, it, uh, it never felt bad, just alarming. In 2007, I moved out, but my mother and brother stayed, and one day in 2008, my husband and I went to visit, and as we did often, we lived only one street away with our garden backing the train line and all that, which we still heard trains, even in our new house. And we sat at the dining table, just talking. My mum got up to get a drink, and my husband and I sat at the table. I glanced down, and... Right between my husband and I was 
two spots of fresh blood. And it was set further into the table than our arms and looked like drops, so I checked my nose and my husband freaked out and checked his too. But neither of us had any blood on us and from where we were sat, we would have had to have stood and kind of leaned right over the table to drip so far in. My mother was really freaked out too and cleaned it up and we all just kind of sat there awkwardly, not really knowing what to say. After the blood incident too, I got talking to someone that once worked in the hospital. She stated that there were apparently some houses here once too. One was the maternity ward and they apparently at one point, before her employment obviously, had a cat to help with pregnant women relax. And that certainly did account for the shadow cat, the crying baby, and I guess to a degree the blood too. My mother had heard the train sometimes too and had seen the cat shadow as well and the baby crying herself a couple of times but never really knew what to say about it. Just that she didn't want my younger brothers to find out or they'd never sleep again. She moved out a few years ago but we all still agree that whatever was happening there wasn't bad, just really creepy. As a child, I, I moved a lot. My mother could never really settle down in one place. And although we'd often leave my hometown, we'd always end up back there and this time was pretty much no different. I was 10 and we had lived in a different town with my mother's boyfriend. However, they broke up after a very abusive relationship and after living in a woman's shelter, my mother grabbed the first house that she could find back in our hometown. The house was a pretty small and normal house for a cotton mill town, Darwin, UK. It was a, a terraced house, small with um, two small bedrooms, dining room, living room and an extension with kitchen and at the very end of the kitchen the only bathroom in the house. My mum's sister C lived only two streets away with my six cousins so I was really excited to be back with them after living in another town where I didn't know anyone. We moved in without even looking at the house as mum was just so ready to be out of the shelter. At this time my mother was also about five months pregnant with my brother and I think that uh, she just wanted to find somewhere to settle ready for his arrival too. Now the house wasn't in good condition. It had really bad damp and it smelled so strongly of damp that it almost made me gag sometimes. The carpets were old, it was a rental, and the wallpaper was just falling off the walls everywhere. But a home is a home, I guess, and it was better than nothing. The first night was really scary, though, and I'd been used to moving around, so I was used to the first night nerves, but this just felt different this time. My room was really small, just enough space for a single bed to go along the wall so my feet or head depending which way I'd decide to sleep would be pretty much against the door frame. I decided to sleep with my feet by the door so that I could keep an eye on the door which was open as my mum had asked me to leave it open so that she could check in on me. And the whole night I sat under my covers with my eyes firmly on the door and I could just feel someone watching me. I don't know if you've ever got that feeling before but... I didn't get any sleep that night. The next night, my mother's boyfriend moved in, but not the abusive one, mind you, another ex that she'd got back with. He was actually a really good guy, too. And the whole feeling of the house just got worse once he moved in, too. We'd be sat watching TV sometimes and hear walking upstairs. We'd hear things moving, taps running in the kitchen, but when we'd look, they'd be off, lights would turn off and on, and all sorts of really weird stuff. On one night, I also woke to see someone standing outside my doorway. I couldn't see features or even a gender. It was late and dark, and I assumed that it was my mother just checking in on me. I watched the figure move towards the stairs and go down, so I got up thinking that it was mum, and I was far too creeped out in the house to go downstairs alone at night, so I thought I'd just go down while she was there to get a drink. However, as I got to the top of the stairs, I, I couldn't see any lights on downstairs. Thinking that that was odd, I checked in my mum's room right next to the top of the stairs and both my mum and her boyfriend were still in bed asleep. Well, I very quickly went back to my room and closed the door and got straight into bed. 
After a few weeks of living there, we discussed the creepy things happening too and the feelings that we felt in the house. My mum decided after that too that we'd look for somewhere else to move. But things, they didn't get any better. I mean, my mum's boyfriend had things thrown at him in the house and heard breathing in his ear one night when he fell asleep on the sofa and all sorts of just really creepy stuff. But moving day came and the men in our family decided that they'd do the moving. My mum's boyfriend, two of my uncles, and a family friend all went into the house to start moving the boxes to the van. I was at my aunt's two streets away, so to this day I didn't see what happened with my own eyes, but all of the men in our family left the house within an hour and refused to go back in because apparently a male voice told them to get out and one of them was pushed down the stairs. In the end, my mum, my aunt C and I ended up doing the moving because they flat out refused to go near the house. My mum's boyfriend even told her to just leave the stuff and he'd buy her new stuff. After we moved out, my other aunt S, who my mother doesn't really talk to, said that she'd lived in that house for a short time in the 1980s as it was one of a, a number of houses in the town that offered rooms to addicts and whatnot. She'd said that a few people had died from ODing in that house and that she had paranormal experiences too in her short time there. I wish that I could find out more about this house, but I don't even remember the house number. I know the street name, but the house is long gone, I'm pretty sure. I think it was knocked down in the mid-2000s and now there are all sorts of new houses there. Although I'd love to know if whoever lives in those houses that stands on that land now has had any experiences too. I've had experiences in a number of homes that I've lived in, but that was the only one that I ever felt was just truly evil.